Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this fireside chat where we'll be talking about... I was wondering, what tactics should private investors be thinking about in these tricky periods? I'll tell you something funny that happened uh, back in 1999. My very first column for the Financial Times, uh, our co-host today, and the very first paragraph that I wrote said, I'm selling all my UK stocks and buying only US ones. So short of a time machine to go back then, and you can see what's happened between the markets of both countries. And that's the same for SIPs and ISIS. I mean, I still get people, you know, I do, I'm a grown adult, as you can tell, and I still get people on my TikTok, I do have one of those, on my TikTok saying, can you put US stocks in SIPs and ISIS? I didn't know you could do that. Uh, and for me, that's been it. It's been the sort of, it's a cheat. I mean, I didn't invent those companies. I didn't make them grow. I didn't innovate them. I didn't do anything. I just rode their coattails. Uh, and it's been probably the simplest, easiest, stupidest thing that I could have done, which has worked out ridiculously well. The Nasdaq's up, what, 38% so far this year? Uh, I mean, last year wasn't great, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And 2021 was, again, ridiculously good. Um, <coughs> Yeah, those companies make me look good. And I know you're very interested in technology. Yeah. And I wondered, how have you been using that recently? Well, this is the other thing. So, uh, on, I, I posted something on, again, TikTok. Uh, I should say I did, sort of, I did have a proper education and I did have a proper career. And I was a visiting fellow at Oxford University. I mean, just in case you think this guy's some kind of YouTuber and what the hell's he doing here? Uh, 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 but yeah, the TikTok thing led to the Investors Chronicle writing a piece, and I kid you not, the headline, and God bless you guys, the headline was move over Warren Buffett, and then they wrote a bit about me, which was way too flattering for, 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 for that, but the, the, then Business Insider picked up on it, and they did a whole article about using AI to select stocks, and what I did is I just talked about what I was doing, pumping a whole load of data into ChatGPT 4 Plus, sticking in um, some of the plugins. You can put in about three plugins into there. And then I asked it, compared to the stocks I picked, I said, okay, and I put the data in for December 2021, because as you know, 2022 stank. It was an awful year. And I wanted to see, will it come up with stocks which might have done better uh, in 2022? Would it have perhaps preserved some of the wealth that was lost in 2022? So I put the data in, and it was the kind of data which you all look at. Okay, so it's everything P ratios to more sophisticated ratios like cash return on capital invested. I then said to it, pretend you're Warren Buffett and also a Nobel Prize winning uh, stock picker like Eugene Famer. And I want you to read all the most important academic literature on stock picking. Tell me what that literature is so I know what you've read and I can make sure that you've read the most important stuff, and then go through all this data I'm giving you and tell me which are the best companies I should invest in. And this went through several iterations, and the magazine covered this, and uh, what, what do you think the outcome was? Any ideas? Do you think the outcome was good picks, bad picks, indifferent? Good? I love your faith in AI. Anyone else? Anybody think there were bad picks? Just a show of hands. Bad picks. Anybody think good picks? I mean, there's a ton of data I put in there, and it could search the web, etc., etc. Okay, well, it stank. Uh, and then I said to it, you stink. Why do you stink? And it said, and this was really important, it said, well, maybe these are several reasons why. And one of the reasons it gave was maybe management wasn't telling the truth. And one of the companies it picked, actually, management had misstated accounts. So it was a humbling experience. It was accurate in that regard, and it reminded me, we'll talk later about what lessons there are in this. But it also separately gave me other picks that, later on, which actually I'd overlooked. So there are uses to it, which I can come back to later. But yes, the use of AI in, in stock selection, it's fascinating, but not in the way people think. And I suspect fund managers are going to use it more as a marketing tool than, than actually something which will be incredibly useful. But as I said, we can talk a bit later about that. That's interesting. I'll ask um, one more question on AI before we move on yep. to the alternative yep. commodities. But I did wonder, are there any major pitfalls when you were sort of playing around with ChatGPT that stood out? Because one thing I wondered was, 
Is it always a little bit backwards looking? Can AI really predict sort of future trends? Yeah, so this is, the, uh, when you're going, one of the most important things, you've got to get the prompts right. So I actually use another piece of AI called Prompt Perfect, but I'm sure there's other tools out there to get the prompts right. It's like most things in life, you've got to ask the right questions. It's as if you've got an employee in your firm and you're asking them to do work for you. And then you've got to ask a bit more. And then you've got to say, well, wait a minute. No, I want you to consider this literature, look at this data. It sadly couldn't see in the future. It didn't have a, more of a crystal ball than me. Now, one day, it'll become omniscient. They'll plug in some robotics to it. That'll make it omnipotent. And most things which are omniscient and omnipotent, we tend to call God, and it'll become like that, apparently. But for now, the limitations were that, yeah, it was, I mean, we're all looking backwards in many ways. I was asking it, and I could test based on the data I gave it, what does the future look like? And it could only tell me, it couldn't beat what wasn't there, in other words. It couldn't come up with a company which didn't exist. So in 2021, it couldn't say to me, put your money in this one, if that company did not exist, other than the ones which shot up were, were, were so speculative and looked so rubbish in 2021, if AI had come up with it, you would have said, well, I'm not putting my money in that. That's just nuts. So it didn't have that power that we're all looking for, which is, do I have some secret source to see into the future? What it gave me was a reminder of avoiding all the biases we make when we're picking stocks uh, and recognizing that actually, even with all that data, there isn't a guarantee, which we know. You know that's why it says it in small print. The future is not guaranteed from the historical facts. So it did that, and the other thing it did is it threw up names which I overlooked and double-checked the, my homework. So it did have a useful purpose, but like I said, I think the fund managers will go nuts over it because it's just great for marketing, and it allows them to pull more money into their funds. Yeah. I'll turn to Irene now for a moment, because obviously we've got started on that. Are there any tactics that you've developed in your professional lives that you think private investors might be able to use. So, Alpesh, if we start with you, so what can hedge fund managers teach yeah. us as mere mortals? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's two things. There's the investing part and there's the trading part. Um, on the investing part, uh, let's say when I'm going back to when I was writing a weekly column in the Financial Times, I was fed up at how often private investors were just putting their money into investment trusts, which were then losing money. And there was a, a ton of research which had been done by an individual who then went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. I've mentioned him already, Eugene Feynman. Uh, and there was stuff done on biases by Daniel Kahneman, who also got the Nobel Prize in economics. These amazing individuals. And I'd be writing about it, I think, look, there's got to be a better way for private investors. So I created a little algorithm, and you can all copy this approach. And since 2004, a software company, I'm not going to plug it, um, which has won many Financial Times awards, by the way, uh, has been using that algorithm and then monitoring my picks. So it's not me giving the picks, they just completely do it independently. And it has done ridiculously better than any fund manager, including Warren Buffett, but you know, he's got so, many, so much money, I wish I could get his kind of returns with the money he has, uh, but any other fund manager. And it was simple, because what it actually did is it just said, well, I'm not going to go just for value funds or just for growth funds or just for income funds. And each one of those funds then has 50 stocks at least in it. So now I've got 150 stocks. And if I want more exposure to NVIDIA, well, I'm screwed because there's 0.01% of my portfolio in NVIDIA thanks to it being 150th of a fund somewhere. Uh, what it did instead is it just said, well, we need to take the value box. And you know, whether it was price earnings ratios or price earnings growth, it was a principle of it had to be uh, it had to take a value box, a growth box, an income dividend yield box, a cash flow box. And the most important uh, ratio that I learned there was one that I stole from Goldman Sachs. I was lucky to be enough uh, at a lunch with them. And they had their quantum team sort of pitching a formula that they themselves stole from Deutsche Bank. And Goldman Sachs Wealth Management used this to this day. And they use it for their wealth. You know, if you've got 50 million, they'll, they'll pick stocks for you using this formula as well. And it was cash return on uh, capital invested. Anyway, so I had to tick that box, Sortino, Alpha, all of these little boxes. And private investors tend not to do that for some reason. What they'll do is they'll do name recognition, and the research shows it. They'll look at a small basket of stocks for some reason. Why not look at all 10,000 and then just filter value, growth, income? And it's got to tick every single box. That would give me more resilience, was my theory. And it did, because the performance proved it. And you might say, well, didn't you put yourself out of a job? No, because that was for private investors. And 
All I'd say to you is screen according to every single one of those filters when you're investing. Do not, and you can create your own. I mean, you know, a cash flow, an income. All companies only have three sets of accounts, the balance sheet, the P&L, and the cash flow, and you're ticking all those boxes. Too often, private investors will go for the news item, end up uh, gambling on which way is the Fed going to go, and all of these factors, whereas, actually, just look at the numbers, tick those boxes. It's not as if you're going to 100% predict the future, and then there were several other things. You're holding for 12 months, and then everybody gets sacked in your portfolio. And you're having about 15 to 20 stocks. And if you want to know why, there's research out there, or ask ChatGPT why. Uh, but after 12 months, everyone gets sacked, because every company in your portfolio is a collection of people who you've hired to look after your children's inheritance or your old age. And they've got to reapply for their jobs after 12 months. Just because Vodafone 30 years ago had an up year doesn't mean you give them a free pass up until this year to F up your pension, which is what they're doing, or whichever other bank you want me to mention. Uh, instead, they've got to reapply, and then you go through the process again. Now, you might still keep Microsoft in there another year because it, it meets the criteria, but this whole buy, hold forever. No, buy, hold for 12 months, then sack and reapply. And you might end up holding stocks for five years. That's mm -hmm. fine. Six years. But can I see the future six years? None of us can. So why would you hold something for six years and say, no, 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 that company's always going to be forever brilliant. No, no company's done that in the last hundred years. So that, those little things, and again, you don't need to pay for any of those. You just, that's how you do it. Tick all those boxes. Uh, on the trading side, very briefly, when I wanted to be a trader, I used to be a barrister many, many years ago. And I wanted to be a trader. So I thought, well, I better meet the world's leading traders because this is my life, my future. I'm not going to just uh, sort of gamble at it. So I went and interviewed 10 of the world's leading traders. And I said again to the Financial Times, I said, I've got 10 of the world's leading traders. Will you publish a book about it if you know, I've, I've got these people? And they said, OK. And the 10 leading traders said, OK, if the Financial Times are going to publish it, We'll, we'll do this, we'll, we'll get interviewed. And one of those people was, uh, uh, well, was a hedge fund manager of the year just recently, and back then was global head of Forex at Salomon's. But those people taught me about momentum trading, which is what you do. And that's probably the easiest thing, I think, for retail clients to do. You're not going to do arbitrage. You're not going to, I mean, options you could do if you really, really want to, good luck to you. But momentum trading, your speciality, and what, you know, the J.W. Henry, the owner of Liverpool uh, Football Club, momentum trader, um, gentleman over there who caught my eye, looks just like George Soros, momentum trader, you, sir, yes, uh, momentum trader on many of their funds. Uh, uh, the, some of the, uh, yeah, Winton Capital, Sir David Harding, momentum mm -hmm. trader, and some of the, and, and Britain's great at this. I mean, it's not often you say Britain's the world leader. I mean, Brevin Howard, uh, what, Europe's second largest hedge fund or largest? Uh, Alan Howard, a lot of their funds are momentum, and I think that's probably where private investors can come in. There's a whole lot of tips around that I can, I can uh, give you, but I can come back to that. Well, that actually leads perfectly into the question I was going to ask you, Rene, because I know so much of your job involves sort of capturing trends and using momentum, and I wondered, is that applicable at all since the, since the start, completely different to the traditional ones? Just on that point, if, if you're looking to do it yourself, uh, most people end up trend following or using momentum trading, using CFDs or spread bets, as you'll know, and they do it over short periods of time where the trends last, say, a week, two weeks. Every single spread bet firm you look at has now, because of the FCA, got to put how many of their clients make money. And the number is, what, 20% make money or 70 to 80% lose money. So the easiest thing for me to say to every person in this room, despite being author of Mind of a Trader, is don't do it because I'm playing the odds. If I ask you to do it, I know in a random group of, uh, in this room, 80% of you will lose money. So why would I ask you to do it? 80% of you will lose money. Or if I'm lucky, maybe only 70% will lose money. I don't want those odds. So I'm going to tell you, don't do it. And you're absolutely right. That's why the investment part is a hell of a lot easier for me to do than the trading part. And as I get older, guess what? More of my capital ends up on the investing part rather than the, the trading. I did, I was an expert witness in court, just very quickly, I was an expert witness in court where a, a person was suing Man Financial a few years ago. And we had to essentially, it came down to whether or not momentum trading works. He said it does. He said Man Financial didn't execute his trades and he was suing them for 21 million pounds. And last day, Man were showing him all this 
research to show momentum doesn't work, therefore the trader, even if they executed his trades, wouldn't have made money. I came in, I showed them the, the research which shows otherwise. Actually, the knockout blow is I showed them that, you know, you've got a division called AHL, don't you, which does exactly this. Um, man lost, Raj won the money, he won 21 million pounds. Uh, we had one hell of a party in Vegas, but that's a separate story. Uh, so there is also contradictory research, but I would say to you, absolutely, if in doubt, leave it out, just don't do it. One, one, word, one thing I would like to add on this, it, it, as it says, it's risky, as we both say, especially the mainstream.